Morning, everybody. Just getting everything ready for the studio walkthrough with April Bay today. Uh, I don't like that image. I'll start with a better image. Yeah, we're doing uh, nice in the studio walkthrough with April Bay today. I'm excited. She's a good friend and an amazing artist. Um, I hope everybody is out there being safe, um, taking care of yourself, learning new skills, being with family, um, taking a, just an account of um, everything that you're going, your studio visits, your um, you know, your bios, all the good stuff that artists should do. It's a very good time while also still being safe. Um, yeah, a uh, little backstory about April. Um, she's a huge friend of mine. I really admire her mind. Um, she was in a um, exhibition that I curated last November. Works did really well for a joint friend of ours, Vita Brown, rest in peace. Um, I'm a huge fan of her work. Um, I think it really hits on a very Afro, Afro futuristic wave that I think she's leading right now. Um, it's just really, really cool. And uh, just getting to talk to her, and I've done an in-person studio visit and seen the process, but I think it's really cool for everybody else to, you know, kind of take into the live video and see how it gets down. So, oh, here she goes. Let's get it going. Hey, April, April, good morning. Hey, good morning. How are you? How's the how's the quarantine holding up with you and the little one in there? The little pup. <laughs> she's laying down here right now. As always, she's not letting you breathe. She's nope. never letting you breathe. So first off, how are you? How is everything doing? How is you health wise and everything? Are you mentally there? Because I know quarantine is driving everybody crazy. And I don't know if I'm even mentally there anymore. How are you doing? Um. I'm a homebody, so like mm. at first I was like, "This is my life, like this yeah. is lit." But then, <laughs> when I had to bring my day job home, yeah, I had a breakdown last week. <laughs> yeah, I I know the feeling. Like I've been having, you know, several breakdowns because you know my workspace, you know, as a person that curates, runs around, and help artists all day is outside, you know, and for the mm. most part, I've been confined to a space which has given me time to think but it's also allowed me time to overthink and kind of you know draw myself into a hole in a few situations because of that overthinking how how has the time affected you know being that you know you are a teacher as well how is this time affecting the role of a, a arts teacher right now the first two weeks of remote teaching, well, first of all, I should preface this by saying over our winter break, I got mm -hmm. certified to teach online. Nice. Congrats. For no reason. I was just like, maybe <laughs> if I teach online, I can be in my studio more. And then yep. this happened and I was mm -hmm. like, bet. But Head then, the like, curve. then it, but they're having us do remote emergency teaching, which is not the same mm -hmm. as online teaching. It's like do what you as much as what you promise them on campus but online mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. my classes are set up in the way that like students take me repeatedly like i get very mm -hmm. few new students it's mostly students who are taking my class because there's a technique that i invented that they know they can only learn if they take my class so i couldn't really change my assignments that much plus plus they already bought supplies so mm -hmm. the first two weeks i couldn't do any studio work because my studio was repositioned to be a classroom. I had to bring all of my demo supplies home. Mm -hmm. I had to set up all of my equipment to film like lectures. I had I have one assignment that takes four hours wow. to, to do in class. It's like a two class period demo. And I had to do that. It took me three days to film that. And so then like a couple of a few days ago, I just like broke down and started like tearing shit off the wall. And like, <laughs> I it was cramped like you you see my studio yeah. it's it's mm -hmm. a living room so that's been converted into a studio so it's like to have all the students work there too like they had turned mm -hmm. in assignments before the school closed so I had to go to my office to get their assignments which are like these big giant ass things and they were just taking up so much space and I lost it and so like my friends were like separate separate take all of the school yeah. stuff out of your studio put it in the dining room so now it's sitting in the dining room <laughs> 
and I, I don't know. It's it's a lot. I I'm definitely doing more work. Like I calculated the amount of hours I now put into answering student emails because they have access mm -hmm. to us all the time now. Yeah. So like. I'm getting paid just a little bit above minimum wage when you count all of the, like none of the committee work has stopped. None of the mm -hmm. administration has stopped. So I still have to do like three Zoom meetings a day. My mm -hmm. internet is tragic up here. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like trying to figure out how to like hotspot off my phone and like upload yeah. YouTube videos that take five hours to upload. So it's a lot, it's very stressful. Like I really envy and respect artists who have the downtime and mm -hmm. can make art right now because I'm like, I've got, I don't know, it's just, it's very stressful. It's traumatic and everyone's going through it and it's sad and. So, so has it really, has it opened your eyes to, you know, when everyone talks about, well, I can consistently, you know, stay at home, work, I could do my job and also be a productive citizen. Do you say no way to that because of how you experienced it? Or do you think that there's a way of actually getting through that? I mean, we're resilient. If you want to survive, you have no choice but to get through it. But mm -hmm. it's hard because like my friends, people who know me know that I'm introverted and I like to be home because mm -hmm. I get tired and I yeah. work. But even me, like when people are hiking up the mountain, I like watch them out of the window and I'm like, oh, like, <laughs> what are you wearing? Like, what do you do? Like, <laughs> I've discovered a few Instagram influencers and comedians that live in my neighborhood because they're exercising. Nice. And I'm like, oh, that's the guy that does the ghetto yeah. voices for the pets on Instagram. And like, it's, um, it's, you still need that connection. Like, I, yes. I want to go grocery shopping. Like, I want to touch some shallots. You know what I'm saying? Like, I want to, like, make sure the avocado's ripe. Like, I want to touch my own groceries yeah. before Hell I buy yeah. them. <laughs> and I want to go eat fat food with my friends. And, like, I don't know. Like, it's it's possible. Yeah. We can do it because we have to. But, like, it's not easy. Yeah. Do you think, like, the role of having to have the stay at home order adds to that because yeah you would work at home you would be normally like you're a homebody but the fact that you can't touch the shallots the fact that you can't go see a show when you want to the fact that you can't just go out hug a friend go have a burger or something like that adds to the you know the i guess the reclusiveness and you know starts to mess with the mental to where it's like you know i don't feel like working on art i don't feel like doing that you get to the point where yeah. it's like, i just want to get the hell out of here you know, yeah. like, does, do, you, do you see that um, opening your eyes to how you've put your students' responsibilities over your practice or vice versa? Uh, I think it's also depression, mm -hmm. if I'm being honest. Like, I'm sore all the time and I'm tired all the time. Um, mm -hmm. It's like, but I'm also the type of person that, like, if I was going to turn right and someone mm -hmm. in the car says to turn right, that I'm not turning right. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> it, yep. It's something oh, yeah. I'm working on, but it's like as soon as the city was like, "We're on lockdown. You can't do anything." I was like, "I need, but I need, I need sugar, and I need to go to the beach." Like, if I'm, you know, I have this dog here that loves to go to the beach, and now all of a sudden I have to go to the beach. It's it's mental. Like we're all going through mental trauma, yeah. and so like my students who are with me, like I said before, they're students that have taken me before some of them have taken me for years and so when I was like okay deadlines are relaxed turn it in by the end of the semester what's good they were like what <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and they're like there's no deadline on this assignment can you tell me when it's due and they're turning yeah. something early and I'm like you need to chill like this mm -hmm. is a state of emergency like people are dying so yeah. this class totally last thing on my mind last thing mm -hmm. on your mind if you want to keep doing it I'll keep giving you dope ass assignments mm -hmm. but I don't care if it's late mm. <laughs> You know, like it's, everything's changing. Like there are no, you can't adhere to post, or I'm sorry, pre-corona protocol and rules mm -hmm. now, even in the art world. Like- Yes, yes, you know? yes. So I was gonna say like, do you feel a pressure to continue your practice while still having your students organized? Because you can't just leave one or the other, you know, idle. You know, so one is going to suffer. You know, so how do you, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you're pulling your hair out with just managing both alone, but how do you, you know, give equal time to both and still stay productive? I don't. Yeah. I never have, though. Okay, so yeah. like before this, I used to get up at 4 a.m. so I could get 
two hours of studio time in before I had to go mm -hmm. teach for four hours. Sheesh. Now it's like they're both in my house. So mm -hmm. they've infiltrated I, you. <laughs> <laughs> so it's ultimately I have to decide which one is for my life. Yes. And I think mm -hmm. institutions are great when they work, but for the most part, at the end of the day, what are we learning throughout this whole process? Corporations, institutions, you're gonna die alone and they won't even know what your name was. So I always put my practice first because if I didn't, I would be a really shitty teacher yep. and <laughs> I would hate everyone and everything. Like the art for me is an excretory tool and especially now mm -hmm. since I'm working on the basis of being like completely off this planet, it's what yeah. I need more than anything now. Most definitely. I totally hear that. So like with if anybody that follows your Instagram, they know that you're a big proponent of process. I mean, you show the process a lot. Has the recent posts of process have been a way to cope, you know, with almost like the the communication with the outside? It's like you you're you you want to be able to, you know, still teach folks about the artwork, but you want some sense of, hey, like I need someone to t I need someone to understand what I'm doing and to maybe possibly comment on this so I can get some engagement because I'm tired of looking at this shit myself. Because I feel like that when I'm writing or when I'm you know doing something here. It's like I mm -hmm. literally find myself walking around the neighborhood for no apparent reason, you know, just because I have to get out and move somewhere. Yeah, <laughs> I share process because that's what I like to see from other mm -hmm. artists. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not gonna be a lot of contemporary art pages only show like announcements for things or pictures with collectors or pictures at galas mm -hmm. or completed art but when i go to shows if they're my friend shows and they they humor me we talk about like process like yeah. uh one of my favorite artists Diedrich brackens every show i've ever gone to where i was blessed for him to be at it I'm like, what kind mm -hmm. of sewing machine do you use? How do you get, how do you get the whole, how do you get the whole like weaving into the sewing? It's like, I'm a process based yeah. artist. So the artists I love tend to also be process based. And mm -hmm. that's what I lust and wish that they would post. Like when they post yeah. anything that shows detail or uh, time and labor through process, then mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, that's mm -hmm. so dope. And, and the end product is great too, but most process based artists are into the process. And then Definitely. other people appreciate the piece when it's done. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. So I, I post a lot of process. Also, I have like a lot of shows that I'm not allowed to talk about. <laughs> yeah. And so like, um, the, like the, the blanket piece behind me, it's like, that's one of like many. And so there's like, I can only show snippets. The, the, the model Astra Marie that's in the piece, she gets to see like full stuff. But yeah, yeah. I have to keep, um, some of the like the whole piece it's also too big to shoot like it doesn't fit in my studio the only way i get to see big work that i make is if mm -hmm. someone gives me a show or oh yeah space to put that, it up that's interesting like has have you you know kind of i guess contracted the work you know started to make smaller work more can more contracted works because of the studio space and being that we don't know the future of uh, gallery shows, museum exhibitions, and how people will interact with them. Has Have you thought about creating smaller works that can actually, um, that you can hang around so that folks can actually acquire um, for their own homes now? Because there's a lot of people that are going to be, you know, take them a while to get to exhibitions where they're like, I'm not going to be around people for at least six more months until this yeah. is cleared or for you. Yeah. Have you thought about that? Um... So I make big work because I, <laughs> I'm nearsighted. Yeah, that's what I it feel means. That. You can't see far away, right? I feel that, yeah. And that started in college. So when my work is big for me to see it and enjoy it from far away. So yeah. <laughs> that's why the work is big, to be honest. Yep. But um, f for the solo show that's up right now and also closed, I'm, I, I do handmade books and those are tiny, small drawings and stuff like that. So yeah, I have... I actually have some watercolor paper up on the wall right now. I'm going to start working on some small drawings um, because that's what my background is in, is in drawing. But I also hmm. have like 12 foot paintings that I'm getting ready to start. I'm happy to see that One Love has joined the live because that's like <laughs> one of the large series that I'm going to be starting. Just giant like 
God series from Atlantica. Um, and those are nice. huge. Like, I can't think to make work to suit the output of who's going to want it or need it or use it. Because mm -hmm. if I do that, mm -hmm. it moves me too far into the commission realm and I suck at commissions. Like, Got I'm horrible. You. I'm like, as soon as someone, t like, again, if so as soon as someone says, I want you to make it this color, I'm like, what color? I don't even know what you're talking about. I'm not <laughs> <laughs> Even if I was going to use that color, I'm like, no, you're telling me what to do. Like, my work has always has to have defiance in it. And at present, I need it to be big so I can see it. And that's all I care about is that I can see. It. Hell yeah. Like, <laughs> that's details. so, like, with. With the works, especially like the Fullerton College show, do they plan on, you know, rebooting that? Are they going to give you that time back? Are you going to be able to reclaim your time back from that museum <laughs> exhibition? Like, because there's a lot of people that are losing opportunity. Like, yeah. they fought for years to get in some of these gallery shows, some of these museum shows, and they're literally just straight up canceled. And a lot of these museums don't have the money, nor do they have even the same staff to re- to redo these shows, rehang them or re, you know, how, how do you feel about that? How do you, you know, are or they talking they'll... about that? Yeah, or if, or if they'll even be open after this. They'd be open, yeah. Yep. Um, so Fullerton, as of right now, their student show, which would have been the show after mine, is going to be digital. Okay. So it looks like uh, Carol, the wonderful curator, is going to keep it open into the summer. Like, nice. like who, she has no one to help her uninstall it. This show is like a retrospective. It has like over 41 of my pieces in it. There's nice. no way one person can uninstall all that work. Yeah, that all that work. So I'm like, just let it sit. Let it sit until the summer. And then like when we get to come out, we can all just go there and look at it. It's a huge ass show. Yeah, it looks amazing. Like I, I've been dying. I mean, I had scheduled to go um, see the show before I had to go to the East Coast. And I got bogged up with a whole bunch of stuff because I live out in Thousand Oaks now. I'm trying to get down to Fullerton. It was crazy. But yeah. So um, yeah, I can't wait to see it. I'm hoping that it's still up um, when it comes on, like when it when the pandemic subsides. Um, but the Welcome to Atlantica series, I've always found that, you know, amazing. Like I see the James Baldwin astronaut thing. I think you had it in another piece as well in the Band of Vices show, right? Like yeah. What's 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 the significance of James Baldwin in the spaceship? Is that like your Afrofuturism, you know? Oh, he's the president on Atlantica. Nice. He's, he's our current <laughs> president, and Grace Jones is our vice president. Nice. So that's why. Like, those are banners that go outside of his, like, office. They have several offices. <laughs> nice. So, like, I'm their official graphic designer. That's yeah. so dope. That is so, so now that leads me to ask, like, do you have, uh, like, I guess, like, superhero background characters for all of these for a book? Because, you know, that's got to come after this. You know, you done told me, you done told me that James Baldwin's was the president and all that. All I see is, like, what's that movie where Terry Crews was the president? Was that Zoolander? No, it wasn't Zoolander. What movie was that? I have, is it uh, sci-fi? It was, yeah, it was, it was very much sci-fi. And Terry Crews that. was the president. It wasn't Fifth Element. But I just see like a, as soon as you said that, I just see like a total sci-fi movie or a cartoon with just that there. That is so freaking dope. It is. But, it's a like, whole world. It's a whole world. All the work is coming from this world. So like the blanket behind me mm -hmm. is going to be like this giant tapestry that's like a band poster for this fictitious band called Thai Snack Fry Dry. And... Uh, Bahamians will get like what Thai snack fried dry is. It's like it's yeah. my order that I get. We have we have like a fast food restaurant in the Bahamas called Bamboo Shack, and <laughs> they they sell like fried chicken and like seafood and stuff. And so my my order is always Thai snack fried dry. You gotta get fried dry, <laughs> so it's really crunchy. And so yeah. there's there's a girl band on Atlantica called Thai snack fried dry. And the concept of this girl band is you never know where they're going to perform. They just kind of appear. So you can buy your tickets. Yeah. And you just know sometime in your life they're going to appear and perform. And, like, this band <laughs> is made up of all kinds of artists. Like, you don't know if they're going to pop up and perform, like, a Broadway musical or if they're going to pop yeah. up and perform prose or, you know, write and sing. And, and you never really know what they look like in, unless you see a poster and you're like, oh, I yeah. should buy tickets for Thai Snack Fried Dry. And then you just go about your life never knowing when they're going to pop up and perform. So, so. so what what about those people that are never in the right place? I guess, like, the digital version of all of this, and it, like, ties into kind of, like, where we are now. 
I'm guess I'm like a, a hypothetical concert. Would you always be able to see them in a digital sense? You know, like even if you're not there, would would it would something like that always you know be digital to where you can always catch, you know, Ty Snack Fry Dry, you know, anywhere for like the app, like the Ty Snack Fry Dry app. You might not be where you're at, but you'd be like, damn, I was just there. I'm trying to run back. <laughs> like you know what I mean? Like I mean, it's of... not like a food truck on Atlantica. <laughs> yeah. We have a lot of telepathy. Like, for example, we have a telepathic food replicator. So you just think about what you want to eat, and it like appears in your mouth, and you just oh, that's dope. You just swallow that's it. Dope. <laughs> so that's like, dope. It's, it's a lot of magic. It's a lot of African jujuism, African mm -hmm. surrealism, African futurism, Afrofuturism, Afro surrealism. It's like it's an escapism world that. I'm making and I'm like, I'm an alien that's on earth to observe and report. So I'm oh, making yeah. this work, uh, not as a human, so to speak. So like, now I'm moving away from using like, pop icon figures. Mm -hmm. And instead using real people that are in my life that I've actually mm -hmm. had serious conversations about this planet with and they're already yeah. there, like they're already activated, like they're Atlantic. Yeah. And so like, Instead of us having conversations like, oh, what would what would I be on your planet? It's more like, oh, I'm going to Atlantica. I have to do that. Yeah, yeah. You like, know what I'm, I mean? So I'm it's like- Not it's, dealing with this. <laughs> yeah, so the people I put in my work are very unique in that they represent certain ideologies that are no longer Earth related. Mm. They're no longer, they no longer function on Earth. So we're obviously from another planet. That's so dope. That's so dope. So how did you choose fabric as the medium you know or textiles not just fabric but like you know textiles different types of you know textiles you know glitter a lot of sequins how did you define that as almost like the um the catalyst for the practice because every time i see the work it has a almost like a soul glow shine to it like yeah. the glitter the glitter always is like the topping you know like back in the 80s they used to have the jerry curl they used to have all that that glitter is like it's always keeping the shine on the work, which draws yeah. collectors to it. What what yeah. what does shine and glitter do for you on the the textiles of your work? Well, glitter in particular is very uh, intentional because mm -hmm. on Atlantica it's our currency. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, we don't have poverty on Atlantica because mm -hmm. it's like our currency is literally in everything. Like if you want to pay for dinner, you just shake your hand and like, <laughs> <laughs> you're good. So like that's. And that kind of also stems, all of my work has a little bit of tongue in cheek in it. So yes. um, I think it was uh, Damien Hurst hmm. that was interviewed and he was talking about his diamond skull piece. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he was like, well, you know, like I try to make work with things that I have an abundance around me. And, you know, money is around me. So. Yeah, yeah. And I, I thought that was like so stupid and like privileged. <laughs> and I was like, wow. So now I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to make art with my own currency and on Atlantica mm -hmm. glitter is currency. So I'm just going to put money everywhere. Money honestly. everywhere. Mm. And, 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 and it is like mostly sustainable glitter and uh, sustainable fabrics as well from a South Korean company that I'm working with. Uh, that is how, how important are specific materials to your practice? Because I know it's like certain people just, they, they, can't go get paint from anywhere they they won't go get glitter from this place they won't go get they they want a special brand just like my buddy norm rest in peace he would only go to nova color and get paint yeah he would yeah. not go anywhere else you can bring him tubes of paint he would not touch it how specific are the materials to your practice the materials in my work have to directly relate economically to a group or subculture i feel is being exploited mm. so my work is also rule based. So as far as like the African wax fabric, mm -hmm. I put a lot of like academic research in, in behind where it really comes from, how it's really made. And mm -hmm. so whenever you see African wax fabric in my work, it comes directly from West Africa and purchased from the women that I do this work with. So the money, so every summer I go back to Ghana, I take more and more people with me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and we just buy out <laughs> we buy out her her supply of wax fabric every summer um because she's the first one i talked to and like worked with uh yes. nana and she she was like you know like if you really want 
to support us. Like the Chinese are bad. Like they're mm -hmm. they're co they're you know neo colonizing every place. They're they're do definitely doing it in the Bahamas, mm -hmm. but. Um, at the same time, they are allowed to exist because of our own corrupt governments, right? So mm. in the Bahamas, the Chinese are allowed to build resorts and do all this bukkake. And the government allows them because in exchange, they, build, they, they fix our roads or they build mm -hmm. schools and, and stadiums. And they do the same thing in West Africa. So like the wax fabric industry is no different. It's primarily occupied. Um, the industry is occupied on the high scale level by the Dutch with mm -hmm. like companies like Blisco. Mm -hmm. But, but the the fabric that actual people can afford are is is Chinese knockoff fabric. Mm. So it's like they're allowed to occupy these spaces within cultures and civiliz civilizations because they fulfill a need that the that the their very own government doesn't provide. Mm. So mm -hmm. if, if if our governments could build stadiums and fix roads with the money they're supposed to be doing that with instead of padding their salaries. Yeah. then maybe the Chinese wouldn't really have a big um, offer to bring to the table, mm. right? But most people who want to solve solutions when they're looking through the lens of corporatism bring nothing to the table but their plate. Mm. So it's like the Chinese have money in abundance, so that's what they use to get what they want. Unrestricted mining rights in Ghana, unrestricted mining rights in the Bahamas, destroy coral reef, build resorts and then go bankrupt and leave the country to bail you out. Like they get to do these things because our own government isn't doing it for us. They're not, they're not building the roads, they're not building schools, they're not building hospitals. So um, that sounds, that's, that's why that's important in my work. I was gonna say that sounds almost like, you know, the privatization of America, you know, even in the art world or even something as, you know, general as our, you know, post office, you know, right now, you know, with everything that's going on with the privatization of all the other facets. I mean, we see private ambulances, we see private trash trucks, we see all of these private municipalities. Um, and it seems like they're trying to let the post office fail so that maybe an Amazon or somebody else can take over. I mean, I see a post office truck maybe once a week, but I see at least 11 Amazon trucks, yeah. you know, around my area. I mean, plus I live right next to like the Amazon factory is like literally mm -hmm. right there. So they're just like spilling out, you know? So, and as far as the art market, you know, I kind of see this coronavirus, you know, pandemic as a almost like a hide and seek type of thing because this is allowing a lot of brands to cut costs um cut staff cut people mm -hmm. that they normally necessarily wouldn't be able to um yeah. under moral purposes yeah. um but now they can say yo we're not financially able you know to actually keep on mm -hmm. these people and no one's going to question that right now you know yeah. and it also leads i talked with matt about this it leads to um mergers you know mm -hmm. there have been uh, mergers in the past, downturns in certain markets, um, where like like Levy Gorby, for instance, you know they've turned to middle middle tier galleries and became a blue chip, you know. Mm -hmm. So there there will be galleries mm -hmm. that will fall off. There will be gal museums that will fall off, but there will also be galleries and museums that you know Voltron up and, and and become bigger. Do you think that the artists? you know, whether building collectives, whether building artist studios, physical or digital, can compete with this new normal and how things are going to be uh, going toward the future? Um, artists can't compete with galleries until collectors stop assigning galleries the prestige that they need to buy art. Yep. Like, unless collectors are comfortable coming and having a meal with me, and my friends mm -hmm. and learning about our work or showing up to our shows without mm -hmm. meeting paparazzi there or like, mm -hmm. I don't know, like my collectors are my friends. Like when yes. this, when all this stuff started happening, two collectors emailed me and they're like, do you have any work? I don't care what mm -hmm. it is. I'll buy it. What do you need? Mm -hmm. Do you need to pay rent? And I was like, yes. Hell <laughs> yes. yeah. Like, of so, course. You know, yes. Like, Yep. It's, I've had I've had collectors go with me to West Africa and help me with translation services. Like there's That's awesome. The, the thing is, like until collectors are no longer concerned with each other, the mm. market and prestige, and like watch me at this opening buy this thing, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then then we it's 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 impossible to compete with that. We don't have that mm -hmm. prestige. We don't have that elitism. Like I in particular don't don't have any art elitist background because yeah. I don't come from that background. Like it is what Damn. it is. So even like mm -hmm. I've had like 
collectors really into my work and then they're like did you go to Yale and I'm like no <laughs> fuck like do I look like I can afford that or had the privilege to have adults around me at the time to help yes. me get scholarships to, like I don't have it takes privilege to know how to apply no yes. To, uh, yes you know and so I until we can get rid of that elitism and classism and like it's 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 impossible to compete because we we are artists will and can create collectives and galleries and do stuff like that we've done it it's been done but it does doesn't get supported as much yes so yes. it's and who knows what it's going to look like on the other side yeah that's that's unfortunate like one of one of the questions and kind of like you know drawing back from the story that you were telling about ghana what i thought was really really interesting is because when when I was in your studio, studio physically, you know, it kind of transforms itself from an artist studio to like a fashion house, mm -hmm. you know, to also, you know, the, the, the Ghana sidewalk, you know what I mean? Like, how do you, how do you, you know, take the convergence of those two worlds into your practice? Because like you said, like you, you go and you get authentic, you know, fabrics, you go and you get authentic products from these folks. How do you think that authenticity you know, gives you a level up, you know, in that work, because folks understand that you really do the effort, you know, in doing that. Um, I, I honestly have never thought about that before. My, mm -hmm. the only way I don't have money, <laughs> I've never had money. And sometimes yeah. the only thing that I can make is like collectors do like to buy my work. So once I discovered mm -hmm. that, I was like, well, that, that's is, if, as long as I keep a full time job, that extra money can go towards benefiting the things that I oftentimes feel helpless to change. Mm -hmm. You know, like if mm -hmm. I, if I feel helpless about women being forced to have their genitals mutilated, mm -hmm. what can I do about that? Like I sometimes just sit around and I'm like, I feel helpless. What can I do? I can yeah. make art. I can show art. I can sell it. And then I can take percentages of that and throw it into the community of women who are creating their own businesses or mm -hmm. donate to foundations that I like. Sometimes galleries don't like that because when it comes to discounts and they're yep. like, hey, are you okay if we do a 20% discount? I was like, oh, I'm gonna donate 20% to this organization. Yeah, so like, that's not like planes for that. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, and that's also the blessing of having a full-time job. It's hard to keep both practices up, but if I didn't have a full-time job, I wouldn't be able to like, use the ancillary income to try to make a change. It's the only way I can sleep at night sometimes. And my friends in Ghana are the same way. Like we're always thinking creatively how to barter or how mm -hmm. to help each other and how to build things outside of the system that has already rejected us and told us that our art and the way we make art isn't good enough. So like a lot of my friends that are in Ghana that are my favorite artists, either went to the art school there that everyone goes to that has professors that teach the same way and expect their students to produce the same work they do. Mm -hmm. And at some point in their education, all of them are the same. They all have the same stories. So at some point they say, I don't want to do this. Yeah. I want to yeah. make my art. And then they're like tossed. They're not tossed out. They get through the program, but then on the other side, they're all doing like radical things. Like my friend mm -hmm. Kwame is literally building his own like, on his own land, he's building his own, like, it's it's a combination of things. It's like a art fair, it's a festival, it's wow. it's a new paradigm in graduate education where you're bartering wow. creatively. So like, you need a DSLR to shoot your work, I'll give you my DSLR in exchange for using your laptop. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. so it's like, these are things that like, I grew up with in the, in the Bahamas as well. Like, that always works, but if you're jutted mm -hmm. right up against a system that's still very much based on elitism and money, mm -hmm. and you're only an artist if you showed in a white cube. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, one question I have with that is, do you think artists should be allowed to become uh, sole nonprofits because of the work, the work that you do? You say you donate, you've, you know, you've, I've seen that you've traveled and, you know, you've worked with students, you've worked with communities that qualifies as some of the nonprofit work that you do, because I'm sure it is costing you more than it's making you. So do you think that artists should be able to apply as nonprofits themselves? Are they not able to in California? I, I haven't. I think you can. I haven't heard of them being able to as a single entity. I've heard of collectives, 
you know, being able to do that. I, I remember, you know, with Sotheby's, we went to uh, D.C., you know, on like the Arts Day and they were talking about these different bills of being able to see like the the regular everyday artists as a fine artist as well, because they were defining, you know, what a fine artist was, you know, versus a street artist versus whatever. And they were only constituting fine art as an acceptable art craft. And fine art necessarily would mean blue chip gallery, white cube, um, when most of California, for the most part, is not that. You know, we yeah. have more muralists, we have more um, artists that run their own businesses that make a ton of money that do not show in galleries. I can't count on how m my fingers how many artists I've met that make six figures that have not had a gallery show that I've known about, but they sell out of their studios. It's mind blowing. You know, like Mark wrote John, you know, we read stories about him selling 10 and $15 million paintings out of his studio, you know? Um, and it's, it's, of course there's a spectrum, but, you know, the, I guess what I'm asking is, you know, should there be a a difference between fine artists and artists, period, to where everyone should be able to receive that uh, support? This is all news to me. Like, I thought fine artists were artists. Like, me too. <laughs> but not there's... not as far as the law, you know, like. Because I remember one of my teachers, Amy, uh, Amy uh, Simpson Santo, she's an amazing writer as well. She was putting up posts to where that people should, you know, go in and, you know, sign this doc, you know, this document that we're saying that, you know, make the term inside of a bill, all artists instead of fine artists, because they were they were excluding like I think it was like 75 percent of California artists. Um, because only like 25% of them were actually in galleries represented by a dealer or a gallerist or were on a roster. So it was something really, I'm going to get more information I'll send to you, but I remember, you know, it was pretty detailed and a lot of folks were saying like, yo, make sure that it says artists in this bill and not just <laughs> fine artists. Um, oh, okay. Cause they probably, it sounds like they wanted musicians and dancers and stuff included. Cause hmm. you know, they're artists now too. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that goes under, <laughs> The whole, so let's talk about artists for a second. <laughs> Do you think that there should be a, a scale on the type of art produced? You know, because in, in, in our art school with art business, I had students that complained about Sotheby's not providing any programming for the performing arts students or uh, the um, students that did set design. They always focused on just full contemporary art, art market. Do you think the world puts away, or do you think that there should be a scale on the artist and the different fields of art? Mm, the academic in me says yes. Mm -hmm. But the artist in me, like I, you can't, what, if you Google my name, almost everything that comes up says mixed media artists. Mm -hmm. Because there's not, I've done video work, I've done performance work, I've done everything. It's like, the government putting labels on what we do is not like something that should function at all. Because as clearly, mm -hmm. the government doesn't know what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, how are you going to tell me what field I fall into? I always came mm -hmm. up thinking fine artists and contemporary artists was the same. I always thought artist mm -hmm. was was in reference to someone who made visual art. Mm -hmm. um, but mm -hmm. as I travel, I realized that like people ask me, what do you do? And I'm like, oh, I'm an artist. And they're like, mm -hmm. oh, what kind of music do you make or mm -hmm. do you dance? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh no, like I make visual art. Hmm. Um, so I'm, I'm, I, I'm seeing that that word is being like stretched a little bit more, but should there be a cap? No, because it's, it's not conducive to, especially the, I can't, I, I, I don't want to say the generation under mine, but it, mm -hmm. as far as my generation goes, mm -hmm we had we had no choice and now we're in our second living through yep. we have had no choice and will have no choice to to focus on one thing yeah do you know what i mean like poverty lifestyle and economic crash twice the first time we graduated and now it's the second mm -hmm. time mm -hmm. there, there is no option to say well i'm a painter mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or i play the guitar because now you have to work at starbucks and you have to learn how to play that guitar out in on the Burbank Square and yep. maybe you're an artist that can teach, but 
can you teach printmaking? Can you teach ceramics? Mm -hmm. Can you teach? So like in my experience, both times I graduated, it was the expectation of the market that mm -hmm. I knew more than that I would know more than one thing. So Very if that's the expectation, I, I think it's a little um, asinine to have mm -hmm. sp like specific disciplines honored over the other and a cap yeah. on what one can do. Well, and on the on the flip side, do you think that it's looked down upon of an artist that just focuses on the studio practice, that does not create their own videos, that does not, you know, offer writing, that does not teach? You know, they just want to create art. Do you think that collectors, gallerists, or even museums look at them as a one-trick pony, you know, in a sense? It's been my experience that galleries and museums and collectors and artist residencies tend to be skewed to more, towards those artists more mm. than artists like me. Mm. I can't do a residency at Studio Museum, for example, mm -hmm. because I have a job. I yeah. can't take a year off and especially, you know, the financial, I have friends that have done it and they said the financial compensation isn't enough to survive in New York. I, oh, no. I don't have, I can't do a lot of artist residencies because I only have summer and winter off mm -hmm. and I have a dog or, mm -hmm. and I'm a full-time worker. And usually um, it's, there's a misconception that those of us artists who have day jobs don't need to sell art. And that's mm. not true either, because there's no day job in L.A. where a single person can live on their own unless you're in <laughs> Hollywood or something. Like, yeah. I will always have to have a roommate. So it's like, um, in my experience, people tend to give opportunities like that to artists who are, I'm only working off of my art. I have a gallery rep representing me and I don't need to do, I don't need to teach anymore. And that's also a blessing. Like, I respect artists who can do that. But in my experience, collectors tend to want to go for artists who are just doing their art because yeah. they perceive that artists who teach are going to. And, and, and you know what? It's not even a stereotype. It's true. There are yeah. there are people who teach who don't have studio practices and don't make mm -hmm. art. Mm -hmm. And my students, I can't see how they keep students because it's like when I was a student, I searched all of my professors to yeah. see if they were still making art. Cause why, why the fuck am I gonna pay you money why to be yeah. an artist if you're not even doing art? Exactly. And so I feel like collectors worry that those of us who teach full time and I'm tenured, so that I've never met a collector yet who's like, oh wow, they're always like, huh, hmm. huh, how do you do your studio practice? I do it because it's work too. And mm -hmm. I've never had a life, my family does not ever have the life to work one job. We've always worked more than one job and so I feel like the artists who just focus on their studio practice get perceived as being more serious about their practice than artists that have day jobs. Hmm. That's been my experience. That's, that's, damn, that's, that's, that's kind of mind blowing because I, you know, I think about that and it's, it's like you have to almost damn near kill yourself to be a part of something that you may not be accepted in, you know, because there's no guarantee that you have a singular practice, you have this singular focus that someone's going to come and just appear and say, hey, your work's great enough or ideal enough to fit in this space and I can sell it for you. So I think it's, you know, it's an interesting, you know, place to be in because on one hand, you, like you said, you have to do all that shit to remain relevant, you know, and also to at least give yourself a chance to be able to be seen to get that bad word called exposure to make yourself money um to survive as an artist when there's these there's the institution that looks at you having to survive as a negative mm -hmm. um yeah i i wonder how these newfound um foundations who are getting getting together, distributing these newfound uh, $5,000 grants and all that stuff, how they're taking this into consideration. Because I personally think it's a stimulus package to keep the art world stable. Because a lot of these people have investments in certain artworks and certain artists that are or will become irrelevant after this corona hits. Because like we talked about in the beginning, there's a lot of those artists who were waiting years for this opportunity, whose markets hit them, uh, whose uh, 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 markets hit uh, a peak, whose shows were finally getting their 
opportunities. And now these collectors have had a chance to sit home, look at their collections, see, you know mm -hmm. what? Maybe I really don't like this shit. Maybe this was some yeah. bullshit that I bought. Maybe I want to <laughs> get rid of You know what I mean? Maybe, maybe yeah. I don't like living with this. So a lot of collectors will rethink their approach to art collecting. So there's a lot of those people that, it, oh, it's my time, January, February, and March, I'm hitting to where their market might take a drop and be replaced with someone else. You know, um, I'm interested in seeing, you know, or hearing, you know, your thoughts about that. You know, there's a lot of great artists and, you know, a lot of artists whose work, you know, kind of sucked, you know, that will lose opportunities because of this. And they worked hard to get them. You know, how do you feel... How do you feel about that? I mean, like we say in the Bahamas, it is what it is. Mm -hmm. Like what, I mean, we don't have control over anything that's happening right now. Yeah. And like, talk. the only thing I've been seeing so far is just how, like, for example, why are institutions in the arts asking artists to bail them out hmm. with art donations? Like, I, the thing is, like, I, I, this whole thing, seven seven thousand dollars, I was supposed to be getting paid mm -hmm. for something that I'm still waiting for payment for, and I don't have the money. And when did you show me? Mm -hmm. Like, when did you show me? When did you like give do anything for me or anyone that looks like me or anyone that like is not like someone you can get prestige off of like when have exactly. you shown an outsider artist? When have you showed like an Asian artist? When have you shown like I don't know like why are you why are you asking for money from us and we're struggling too like everyone's yes. struggling like yes. the fuck like why is this and and it's not just it's not just institutions that are doing this it's like mm -hmm. artists that are like way well off than me that are sending me links to their online show and auction and i'm like damn like <laughs> your work is selling for thirty thousand dollars like i would never even know what that is like like how well, are you technically... asking me for help Technically, their work is selling for fourteen thousand dollars because they're getting yeah. that fifty-five percent hit, depending on what gallery they're in. So, and then these artists, some of them, you know, because I talk to a lot of those artists too, they're overproduced mm -hmm. to where a lot of these, you know, gallerists and museums were expecting shows in the next three months, six months to a year that that shit ain't happening. Mm -hmm. You know, like. So there's a lot of artists that are sitting there with tons of work for shows that they don't even know if the collectors or the museums are going to have the budget to buy, the space mm -hmm. to show, or even a place to store. So what are they going to do? Those $30,000 sales now look like shit because those same collectors now know that, hey, you know, I could potentially get that work at $8,000 now. So you know, why, why would I continue this price hike? You know, because that's, that's what it is. You know, those, that, those gallery shows, those museum shows were there in order to assist in the career building. We know that's yeah. what happened. You know, so now when that's not there, the value, the, like, it's almost like a stock option. The option on that artist was for a time period. That contract is going to expire. And if that artist themselves can't keep up that, not only the production, but the value they're going to lose and they and they may not ever recover. So it's going to be really, really tough, you know, going forward to even see that, you know, just pricing. I, I'm, I, maybe, I think I might be more nihilistic than you, but dear, because mm -hmm. I really like think that everyone who's on top, who was on top before this is going to be on top right after. Mm -hmm. And those of us who were struggling because we didn't come from the same backgrounds are going to be right where we were. I I don't and I and I and I feel that way because the corporations are doing the same things that they were doing before like literally mm -hmm. I'll give you an example so I I'm supposed to be I was supposed to be going to Morocco at the end of summer to do mm -hmm. some uh Berber research and also to take a vacation like shit yep. and yeah, yeah. The airlines it's against the law for them to <laughs> it's against the law for them to cancel a flight and not give you a cash refund Mm -hmm. Like that's the law, but mm -hmm. are airlines adhering to that? No, 
they're taking people's money and giving them credits for credits. when are they going to be able to use it. And so the go our government literally had to publish an article. The aviation authority had to say, hey, you're, you're breaking the law. And mm. now we have to call and remind them that they're breaking the law before, before wow. they'll follow the law. And that to me is like, people are dying. Like someone is calling you and saying, hey, so look, my partner that was going on my honeymoon with me died. Can I get that money back so I can bury them? And the airlines are like, we'll give you a credit. Give you a credit. Like what? What is that? that so that's like, why I'm very cynical. I'm very cynical. Like, I just don't yeah. feel like this is hitting enough people. If I still have people in my inbox who have never worked with me before asking me for art. Hmm. Hmm. It's like, did you ask me how I'm feeling today? Or like, if any, if, how this is deal, how do I even have art? Because all of my art is in a show. Yeah. Clothes right yeah. Now. So <laughs> yeah like, that's the question. I just I, I I know the artists that we're talking about and I feel like there's this brand, especially in the black mm -hmm. art community, and that brand is gonna be right there. It's gonna mm -hmm. be right there, right after this. And Well, yeah, I, I agree. You know, there's always a there's always the top of the, you know, the, the cream of the crop, you know, that will continuously be supported because you know, if we're like relating it to stocks again, you know, there's those Fortune 500 companies, Fortune 100 artists that we see on the art net lists and all of that, that pretty much hold up our market. Their values hold up, especially the secondary market. Um, so I, I, I agree with you. They'll be fine. You know, but then there's that, you know, that mid tier market, you know, where the galleries, um, they were just getting, you know, just really getting to that cream of the crop. Um, or just climbing up that that you know will take a hit you know because the rubel collection won't be able to show them or this institution won't be able to give them that show that boost i i just i just don't see the art market being as healthy afterwards because the mid the mid tier is going to suffer just like our housing market you know if people yeah. if regular people can't buy homes you know, what does it matter that the one percent is buying hundred million dollar homes? The majority, you know, can't afford, you know, rent. You know, so how stable will the market be? You know, the overall market. There yeah. will be, you know, that top end market that will continue to buy Basquiat's, they'll continue to buy um Picasso's and all of the names, but then there'll be a gallery market that usually supports that that are not producing new new uh stars in a sense mm -hmm. you know yeah so. and i feel like the good galleries the few that are actually good like mm -hmm. i'm thinking about my gallery in particular but like mm -hmm. the, the galleries that actually have good people running them are the ones that are just going to disappear after this because no one no one's going to bail them out yep. and yep. so yeah. what's what's a solution for an artist to just prepare, you know, for after this. I know I'm not saying that you have the answer for it, but, you know, mm -hmm. trying to just prepare for a new normal, you know, even just something like having, you know, understanding of your email list, your contact, being able to have direct connection with the people, like you said, you know, the folks that support you, because those collectors are going to possibly lead you into a new normal, you know, having, I remember Jerry Salt said, you know, one time, if you have, you know, five good collectors, a curator in your squad, and someone that understands numbers, you don't need a gallery, you know? So mm -hmm. is it time for artists to start thinking like that? I mean, it's it's been time, but there's also, I'm welcome to invite galleries to join in and change the paradigm as well, mm -hmm. because all the galleries, there's been a few exceptions, but most of the galleries that I've worked with are happy to sit with me for three hour studio visits to talk about what I want to see changed and what we can do to work with, with, with other galleries together. And I feel like it's not hard. It's like the, the problem that's happening now is that what galleries used to do for artists, artists are now being expected to do for themselves. Oh, so yeah. I am expected to write a press release and send it to you. I'm mm -hmm. expected to promote my work and to tell everyone I know to come to the show. I'm expected to keep promoting that work while the show is up. Mm -hmm. And, and that's fine, but that's not 50% fine. 
at all. And <laughs> then after the show, if you sell really well, the gallery wants you to marry them. But they don't want to give you a ring and they don't want to like fill out the paperwork and they don't want to pay you a monthly stipend. At all. So it's, so it's like, and that's okay. Like state your expectations up front, but I'm also going to state mine. And I feel like mm -hmm. if we can't work together to figure out like, it helps you if I keep moving on, if I keep doing yes. big things, if I keep showing it other places. And, and as long as you are the one that set me off, there's nothing wrong with throwing stuff back at you and collaborating with you mm -hmm. and telling other galleries, you got to talk to this gallery first. There's mm -hmm. nothing wrong with that. But what I'm finding is that some galleries don't want that. They just want you to stay with them and, and rely on them. And they don't want to do anything beyond checking mm -hmm. in with you from time to time and seeing what they can make off of you. And that's mm. not that's not a humanist relationship. That's not yeah. humanity. That's like so corporatized and like capitalist. Sterile. Yeah. And it's like, yeah. how am I supposed to, and the same thing with collectors too. Like I want like can I can I cook you dinner? And mm -hmm. then we can talk about art. Or mm -hmm. can we can we like go somewhere other than where cameras are gonna photograph us all the time? Like, mm -hmm. can you understand mm -hmm. really? Like a lot of my collectors know so much about my work and can tell you so much about it because we talk about it and like yeah. it's I, and the, you know and i and there's also cultural differences i get told all the time there's cultural mm -hmm. differences like in the bahamas you can't just ask for something yeah you have, good morning <laughs> how, how how you how your mommy doing yeah you say <laughs> and then you ask then you ask yeah <laughs> for a thai snack fry. i don't know it's like it's it's but this this has been my my struggle with LA all along is that you can't even go to openings and just be like what you watching on Netflix it's like what are you doing next what's your next what's your next show and oh like, yeah I just want to know what kind of what kind of marinade you put that meat that you posted on Instagram you know like <laughs> it's like I don't know I I am not I'm cynical in that I believe that the people who were doing fool and doing wrong right before this are going to still be doing fool and doing wrong after. But I am usually optimistic in that I feel like I can talk to anyone and like, mm. there's always conversations that can happen. It's, it's not impossible for galleries to be like, you know what, let's just pump up all of our artists everywhere mm -hmm. and make as much money as possible. And by doing that, our success becomes theirs and vice versa. Theirs. Yes, yes. Yes. Well, thank you so much, April. I know it's it's, it's lunchtime for me. I'm too. Like, I got to get some food. I've been. It's it's hot. I need to prep for a whole bunch of other stuff. But yo, mm -hmm. like, I truly appreciate. Truly, 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 as always, appreciate your artistic mind, your presence, um, the work you create, and just the conversations that we have. Even you know DM and stuff like that because you're very insightful and just the stuff that we talk about is just super duper awesome and i'm always available if you need me um please reach out I'd love to you know just build more because there's going to be a new art market after this um that's really going to be dependent on artists and the way that smart people think and how they can manage inside of it um but yeah dude i appreciate you and i hope you're staying safe over there and i'm always available for you if you need dude so Thank yes, you so much. And anybody fun. that wants to ask anybody any any questions, you can put them down here. Um, I'll, we'll make sure that April gets them. And please go check out her work. She's awesome. I'm saving up my coins so I can get some money too and buy some work. So payment plans. Whoop whoop. Oh, don't should have told me that. I just got that twelve hundred in. So. <laughs> Thank you, April. Thank you, everybody, right. for joining us. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.